Uh, my name is Andrea Anderson, and on behalf of the Skillman Foundation, I want to welcome you um, to our, I'm just trying to figure out how to turn that notes off, welcome you to our conversation today. I am um, pleased to be able to, for the very first time, have the pleasure of introducing our new CEO, Angelique Power, to give an official welcome. She's been here for about a month, and I'm in love already. And so to stay on track and stay on time, Angelique, I'll turn it over to you for a few remarks. Hi, everybody. I'm in love right back. Um, I'm so <laughs> glad to be here. I'm Angelique Power. I am the president and CEO of the Skillman Foundation. Um, this is my first Let's Talk session as president and CEO. And the reality is that so much of our work is listening and learning and coalition building. We do this one-on-one -on -one with each other. We do this in groups. Um, we do this with usual suspects and unusual suspects. Having conversations like these in public spaces and inviting a robust idea exchange makes us all better. And I'm thrilled to be here again and, and thrilled to be in this Zoom room. The other thing that I will add is that there are a series of reasons why I am here at the Skillman Foundation. Um, the focus on Detroit, this amazing city, um, the focus on education systems and how we can rethink them, the grounding in racial justice, and the fact that Skillman has always backed young people's dreams. Our mission is to make a better world where everyone, every child, every young person has power and freedom to design their own destinies. And the other thing um, that I'll mention is when I think of the last year and a half, I think of young people leading uprisings across the globe. And in particular, I think of black and brown young people leading multiracial coalitions, multi-generational coalitions that have already started to change this world. Young people in particular, they see the world differently. They don't want to trim at the margin for change. They wanna rethink the entire system. They don't want a piece of the pie. They wanna own market share in the bakery. And that type of thinking is actually what is gonna lead us to new places. So I'm at Skillman to plan with young people. I believe that not only um, in this moment are they the architects that we need to design a better future, they are the visionaries that we need to lean into to have a better today. So with that, I am thankful to our panelists, to the President's Youth Council. Um, I just wanna issue a warning, our panelists are gonna bring it. So whether you are watching it today, um, whether you're tuning in tomorrow to see, I'm so grateful that you're here. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Andrea to share this really important research that we conducted. Oh, I'm just beaming and smiling. I love every, love hearing from Angelique. Um, so I wanna turn it over to the panelists now to introduce yourselves and, and um, ask you to tell us your name, your school or where you work and one thing that gives you hope. We'll start with Darren. All right, hello everybody. My name is Darren Anderson. I am a currently graduated from 2021 from Detroit Osborne. And what gave me hope is the people and my peers that look up to me and family members that's, that's like in love with me, yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Grant Johnson. I go to Cast Tech, and something that gives me hope is getting out of this pandemic. Oh yeah. Hi, my name is Isabel Maynard. I work at the Detroit Hispanic Development Center in the youth department. Um, and what gives me hope is having power over my own future. Awesome, awesome. Well, before we begin, I just want to explain what we're going to do um, for the next <clears throat> little bit less than an hour. <clears throat> and that is to quickly go through some top line findings from our recent pilot of a Youth Hope 
survey that went out last May. And I have to pause every time I talk about time frames because COVID gets my timing all messed up. But last May. And then we will turn to the panel to have some discussion about the key themes. And then we'll open up the floor to all of you for questions, answers, and comments. So what I think will work best is if you drop your questions or comments in the chat as we go along and we can circle back to them. And when we get on the other side of the panel conversation, feel free to take yourselves off of, my, off of, off of mute or raise your hand and we'll go um, through as many comments and questions as we have time for. Does that sound good? Okay. So now I am going to share my screen and we'll, we'll start one second. All of these things work differently. So give me 30 seconds of grace. Okay, so what's hope got to do with it? And I promised myself I would not say that as if I'm Tina Turner singing what's love got to do with it. So consider yourselves lucky that I didn't go down that road. So I want to start by explaining why we even invested in creating a measure of youth hope and um, why that's important for the opportunity agenda. This term, the opportunity agenda, is the way the Skillman Foundation describes our strategy. It, it, it is the agenda that we believe will make life better for kids while they're in school and when they graduate and go on to college and career. So when we think about how, as a foundation, we want to understand if we're seeing progress, we have three key metrics. Third grade reading scores, because we do a lot of work in the K-12 space, meaningful high school graduation for that same reason, and the youth perception of hope. And so, as you can imagine, the first two metrics are, I won't use the word easy, but relatively accessible. We can get that data from schools. We can get that data from Michigan Department of Education. What we hadn't been able to do up until now was really have a robust way of tracking youth perception of hope. And that is at the pinnacle of this diagram for a reason. It really is our most important metric. We believe that if we're doing a great job preparing children by improving um, what happens in school and by providing really high quality out of school experiences that we will see that manifested in increased levels of hope. We also believe that having high hope is both the precondition to the academic achievement and an outcome of academic achievement. So in every way imaginable, this variable is a really important metric for all of us at the Skillman Foundation. So what we'll do today, and excuse me for having an asthma flare up today, but that's life. <clears throat> what we'll do today is review the results from the pilot of the Youth um, Perception of Hope survey. And then I think what we're really doing for the first time in a very public way is making meaning together which is a habit that I'm really hopeful as the direct evaluation and learning here, I'm really hopeful that we'll start to do this more. Digest data and make meaning of it. D decide what, um, what, what resonates, what doesn't resonate, um, what the implications are by talking to young people themselves. Last May, um, we had two of our research partners, Michelle Gambone, who's, uh, who runs the youth development uh, YDSI, a, a youth development consulting firm that does national evaluation and, and, and research about young people. And Jane Morgan, who's based here in Detroit, partnered to create the pilot of a survey. And then um, Jane leaned on her relationships with folks at Connect Detroit to get access to all of the kids who registered for summer youth employment. And they were offered the opportunity to take the survey, which took about 15 minutes on their phones, um, and as an incentive, they were given a chance to be in a raffle to win one of 100 gift cards. So um, about 2,000 students completed the survey. Most of them were in high school. Most of them were Black or Latinx. And girls made up about 63% of the sample. So that's who took the survey. And the survey asked a lot of questions, um, but they fall into four big categories. We asked questions about hope, access to caring adults, 
college readiness and optimism. And so we're gonna go through each one of those points um, one at a time. So when you design a survey, I know everyone on this call has taken surveys at one point or another, you ask a lot of questions to get at one core idea. And so when we asked the questions about hope, there were really two um, dimensions of hope we were interested in tracking. Agency, which is this notion of feeling like you're in charge of your life. You feel like things are in your control and pathways, which is you know how to get where you wanna go. So, excuse me, we asked six questions and, and they added up to these two dimensions and taken together, this is how we understand how youth perceive hope. So when we look at the results of this, we see good news across both the agency, how kids feel about being in control and pathways that they believe they know how to get where they want, we see that the majority of kids were high or in this middle area um, when we analyze that data. So that's great news. We look at caring adults in a similar way. We asked about five questions and um, those, the question was with this STEM, how many adults in your life other than your parent or guardian would you say, and then you know would say something to you if your life wasn't going right, know you well, and so on, and added those up to get a variable, I mean, a dimension around attentiveness and how well young people think the adults in their lives know them. It's important to know that um, rather than having kids try to count how many adults fit these um, criteria, we asked them if they had three or more, one or two, or none. And so when we look at the results, Having three or more was considered high, having one or two is considered in the middle, and having none was considered low. And this is where we get to see some good news and some not so good news. 55% of the kids had three or more caring adults in their lives outside of their family, but 45% but have one, two, or none. 20% reported having none. So we need to remember that when we get in the conversation later. The other thing that's notable about the caring adults um, uh, variable is that the number of kids who report having three or more caring adults in their lives appears to decline as the kids get older. So you'll see here that I can't, I gotta make that smaller. Okay, 62% of the kids in the, cert, the, the young people who took the survey um, reported having, I'm sorry, the seventh graders and eighth graders were more likely than kids in the other grade bands to report having three or more caring adults in their lives. You can look at it from the bottom up that the 11th and 12th graders were most likely to report low numbers of caring adults. So either way you slice this particular graphic, this, the takeaway is that the number of caring adults in kids' lives appears to decline as they move from middle school through high school. The other thing that's interesting is looking at the relationship between these ideas. So here we have, we looked at kids with high hope and low hope and how they um, pan out um, with caring adults. So what this graphic says is that of the kids with, that reported high hopefulness, 72% of them also have high numbers of caring adults in their lives. Now, this is not causal. This is not to say that having high hope um, generates num high numbers of caring adults or having lots of caring adults causes high hope. That's another thing we hope to unpack with the panelists. But there is clearly a strong relationship between these two uh, factors in, in young people's lives. So the next thing we want to look at is perception of college readiness. And again, we asked about six questions and they fell into two dimensions. Young people interacting with adults who have high expectations of them about college or career and young people having their own sense of confidence, their own sense that what they're doing now is gonna prepare them. And when we add those together, we get this variable youth perception of college readiness. 
And when we look at that, again, it's relatively good news. 45% would fall in that optimal category, meaning that the adult expectations were high and their own sense of confidence was high. And then their intermediate meant that one was high and maybe the other was low, but the risk group had low, both low engagement with adults who had those expectations and their, their own sense of preparedness and confidence was low. So this is good news because we want 45% or more, we want all kids to feel ready for college, but I think that we should be concerned that there's even 16% of kids who don't feel that way. Again, when we look at the relationship between caring adults and perceptions of college readiness, we see of the kids who reported having high numbers, three or more caring adults, almost half of them were in that optimal perception of their own readiness. That's good news. But on the other side, we see of the kids who said they had low caring adults in their lives, the vast majority, 69%, would be in that risky category for college readiness. So that's something we'll talk about. And then finally, we asked some questions about optimism. Um, and there we asked one question, but in um, four different ways. In May, we asked, by the end of this year, I think life will be better than it is now for me, for my family, for my community, or for race relations. And the young people rated each one of those statements. And when we look at the results, we see good news. 92% of the young people who took the survey reported high levels of optimism that things would be better for themselves or their families by the end of this year. When we look at how they responded to that question in relation to community or race relations, still relatively good news, 60% feel very optimistic, but that's a significant drop off from, the, from how they felt about themselves and their families. So we wanna unpack that a little bit um, in the conversation with young folks. So that was the race through the survey data. I'm gonna stop sharing if I can remember how there. And I want to turn um, our attention to our panelists. So um, I'd like to start back at the top with the questions about hope. And I'll start with Isabel and ask you, we think that the survey results mean that most of the kids um, here in Detroit, or most of the kids who took this survey feel really hopeful. How does that resonate with you and your friends? Does that seem like um, realist, a realistic finding? Um, as far as for self and family, I feel like it is a realistic finding. I feel like overall, um, me and my friends in the community feel like you have a general control over, like your family has a general control over where you go in the future, even though there might be other obstacles. And as a person yourself, you have general control over the decisions you can make that lead you to success in your future. Mm -hmm. But compared to race um, relations though, I think that's different because that is a large national like problem with hundreds of years of history to back it up that we, even though as a youth, we have been fighting and pushing towards change and equality and stuff like that. That's something that we definitely have less control over. So it's hard to feel as hopeful, especially when in the media, we're watching people like George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, just colored people in our um, country have horrible things happen to them. So mm -hmm. it's hard to be as hopeful. So it's interesting that you did two things. Um, you spoke about power and control which was way back at the beginning of the slides, we talked about how we were thinking about hope with the word agency, which means exactly what you just said, and pathways, which means knowing how to get there. And then we ended with optimism about race relations. So if we go back to the beginning and think about um, the kids you know who are really hopeful and maybe the kids who aren't so hopeful, thinking about that agency and pathways, um, do you think you can talk to us about what may make the difference? Like, what do you think the kids in your life who are more hopeful 
or feel that agency or seem to know the path forward? What makes them different from other kids? Um, I feel like I'm a little bit confused on okay. what you're asking. So can you like rephrase it again? I'll, try, I'll, I'll do it better than that. Um, at the beginning, we talked about how lots of kids were hopeful yes. because they felt they had this sense of agency that they were in control and they knew how to get there. And so what I'm asking you, I'm sure that you're around um, lots of kids who are hopeful and some who aren't. Yeah. What's the difference between the ones who are hopeful and the ones who aren't? Um, I know we didn't necessarily bring up the caring adults part yet, but okay. I feel like that is a way larger part that goes into it than the youth probably even realize themselves. Like sometimes I feel like that's a bigger thing that goes into youth being um, optimistic for the future for themselves and for their families than they may even realize it's a playing factor because when you're young, you obviously are trying to navigate the world around you and figure out your place um, in our society and just like what's going on in general. And you kind of need those role models, people to look up to to see, oh, I can get here, but also people that are, you know, are supportive of you and will remind yes. you that you have like something in you to get to that place. And unfortunately, um, I do have a good mix of knowing kids who are super optimistic for their future, but I know a lot of kids who aren't optimistic about their future and I've been there as well. And those friends of mine, they definitely don't have adults behind their back, like rooting them on, telling them, how to get there, helping them and just letting them know that they're doing what they can, you know what I mean, to get yes. where they, they need to. And that's like super important. The kids who lack that definitely lack confidence and hope as far as going into the future, for sure. Yep. So Darren, um, if I asked you, thank you, Isabel. Darren, if I ask you to think back to the very beginning of the, of the slide deck, when we talked about hope, an agency, meaning that feeling that you can do what you want and pathways, this notion that you know what the steps are. How do you, how do you think you would describe the kids in your life who are high, you know, on agency and pathways from those who aren't? Like, what's, what's the difference? I feel like the ones that's high, they got more supported, like, like my bad for stuttering, but parents in their life and more mentors in their life for the low ones they have they barely have like a lot of people that can count on and the trust they believe into the adults so I feel like the difference is like it's just more support and and like with the believing for, like for mm -hmm. the and in my perspective and my friends so I got some friends that got high hopes and <clears throat> my bad I got some friends that got high hopes and some friends that got low hopes because they don't have like any like be either because they parents passed away or different reasons in their life that I don't know about but like parent parental issues issues my bad for stuttering don't don't apply. look you you're stuttering and I have asthma so we're on the same page um and what about Grant did you want to weigh in on this conversation about hope Oh, yeah, I like to add something, but I think that people my age or my friends uh, that have hope are the ones that have more caring adults in their life because the more caring adults uh, they have kind of helps shape their life and give them advice on what they should do to have a good future and things that help the caring adults in their life get to the point that's in their life. So I think the better, the more caring adults you have, the better your chances are of having hope. And yes. Okay. So I want to pick up on that because one of the things we saw on the slide of, that looked at the different grades and how the number of kids who said they had high numbers of caring adults seemed to drop as they got older. How would you explain that? And I'll start with you, Grant. What, 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 what do you think explains having less or fewer numbers of caring adults in your life as you move from seventh grade through eighth through, through high school? I think uh, having caring adults in your life changes as you get older and go through the grades it happens because p as you get older, people that you may agree with as you're younger, like your aunts and uncles or just family friends that you may talk to on a regular basis, they may start to drift away as you get older and get busier in life. 
And also as you develop your personality, you two may not be seeing eye to eye as you were when you were younger, when you didn't know as much that was going on in the world. So I think as a person or a child gets older and goes into their teen years, you know, so it becomes an adult. I think that's one of the reasons why they lose hope in uh, adults, carrying adults in their life. Mm -hmm. I see you nodding, Isabel. What do you think that explains that decline? Um, I think definitely what Grant said explains the decline, but I think as well that it comes down to when you get older and you start going to middle school, high school, those like areas of your life, you obviously start um, having different experiences, things like start, I don't mean to say like mistakes, but you're growing up, you know what I mean? You, you're making mistakes, you're experiencing new things you didn't experience before, we, you have questions about the world. And I feel like as you get older, there's less adults around you that you can trust with this information, like genuinely trust in order to ask questions and feel like you have guidance. And I also feel like sometimes when you go into middle school, like you start getting into middle school, you start having those kids where it's like, people will be like, oh, that's a, um, like that kid gets in trouble a lot, that's a bad kid. And then I feel like teachers or like role models that are around you start treating those kids as less than mm -hmm. when they need to be treated with just as much compassion, kindness, leniency with work as the other kids because you don't know what they have going on at home or mm -hmm. why they are making these choices. So then if you're one of those kids, you definitely feel like you have less adults to open up to and it only leads to different pathways. Mm -hmm. I love that. Darren, what would you say about this, this drop-off as kids get older with the number of caring adults they have access to? All right. Bringing it back to middle school, I feel like kids at that time usually be immature, so they will have to depend on adults and the peers they're around, so they have to look forward. But as they age, like from like 9 to 12, so I feel like once they get in their high school stages, like in teen stages, I feel like they will like like get a better perspective of life and they want to move into their own path and into the future because like they want to do things their own and they don't have to trust like what everybody else said, which is like they don't really trust like with any information like that. So as I believe that Josh will be is so <clears throat> not bad. So what I feel like is the drops like he going down because I feel like they don't really have a dust because the adults in their lives will like feel, um, what's the word, what's the word? Or I feel like the adults will in their life will just, will just let them go on in their own ways. My, my bad. No, don't apologize. I wanna, I wanna ask you another question. That you really shouldn't apologize, you're doing great. Um, somebody flashed in the chat a question that I wanna ask you. Where, where do you and your friends develop these relationships with caring adults that aren't your, that aren't in your family, that aren't your parents or your caregivers. Like in your own experience, when you think about the caring adults in your life, where did you meet them? Where I met the caring adults at is AmeriCorps because they got some good mentorships in this program. Usually my supervisor, her name is Lisa. So, and Ramona, well, like, I feel like I didn't have hope at all because when I first came into the job, like I was, was it hope for my future or anything about college. So as I fell down during the summer youth program at Wayne State, I feel like my hopes went up and looking up to them and I currently do right now. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you, Grant and Isabel, the same question. You know, uh, if it's not too personal for you to tell us where you met the caring adults that you have in your life. Maybe Grant and then Isabel. Okay, so the place I met most of the caring adults in my life was I'm a Boy Scout. So a lot of my Boy Scout leaders and people like that always want to help me improve in life. And other places that I've people met good uh, role models and leaders are sports programs and things like that. So coaches and trainers and things like that, that want the best for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Isabel? Um, for me, the definitely the caring adults I met in my life are like in my workplace. Um, there, I feel like I have a lot of mentors and people to look up to and people that genuinely care about me and definitely like school when I was younger, you know, like teachers and stuff like that. And 
I found a lot of caring adults in like whatever interests I was partaking at the time. So when I was younger, I did like cheerleading and tennis. So like my coaches and now um, I'm learning how to like sing and record. So the like mm-hmm. other musicians that I'm around. So. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so when we think about the college readiness, oh, we're going to transition to Q&A. All right. I see that. So let's move forward um, to ask you one last question. Um, we talked a lot about caring adults. We talked a lot about hope. What do you want to tell the, the adults on this call about what adults need to do in Detroit to help more kids be more hopeful and optimistic about their future? And I'll start with you, Isabel, but then Isabel Grant and Darren, and then we'll turn to Q&A. I feel like I want the adults in our community to really instill that every single youth in our community has potential to do something, whether that be college or going into a trade or right into their career. Like, I just feel like every person doesn't take the same path. And um, I feel like the adults around us should help be supportive and also guide the youth into whatever path they feel like they'd be passionate in, not necessarily um, pushing a certain direction on us, because I feel like that's usually what happens, whereas I think we need to be more supported in whatever direction we want to go into. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would say that uh, as adults should try to make sure they reach out to youth at least once a month and just make sure they can have check-in points to make sure that they're doing fine and they need any other support in any areas of their life that they they have somebody to talk to and that can give them some uh, pep talks and motivation to do what they're doing and thrive for what's uh, going on in their life. Mm-hmm. That's excellent. And Darren, you get the last word before we go to Q&A. What, should, what, what do you want to tell the adults in the on the call? I feel like adults will, will they like our answers. So I feel like they should reach out more to like schools, to the teachers and principal will have like a, like a, a weekly talk to like the students, like, so where they don't feel like down for on themselves. Like, so like students that's going to class, like they don't really like their teachers like that. They can have like a whole like discussion, class discussion for like 30 minutes and the adults can help implement into this, like in the school system, like whenever they time, whenever they got time to talk. So I feel like they will like, the adults should just uh, like expand the knowledge and just like try to call it and just check on their youth members. And if they don't know, they can just reach out and go to schools and just talk with the counselors or, or you can just help like therapists. Like, well, like can they have like their own mini therapists because some have like thoughts. So I feel like, yes, you would, adults would talk to them more when they buy <clears throat> Hold on, messing up. We can hear you. All right, hold on. Okay, and the last thing is, yeah, we can just uh, do a call like this and where you can have a 1v1 conversation with other adults between mm-hmm. the youth, with the adults and the youth. So I feel like they will have like a discussion where we haven't, but they will ask us questions, we will ask them questions and they will like, it's like a 1v1 for real. So you can just, they can like decline our debates or good answers and we can just love their answers too and we can just try to infuse them together and and that can help us out so i hear interaction conversation i hear reaching out and checking up i hear being compassionate and loving so i think you've given all the folks on this phone call a lot to think about i think that um, many of the folks on this call Uh, run the kind of programs that you've described. So I want to see if we can get everyone to come off mute and give the panelists a round of applause. Thank you. And so, um, so just so you know, the round of applause was kind of lame because people couldn't get to the off mute quickly enough, but I can see, and I hope, I hope you can see the smiles on the faces of all the folks on the call and, the, and take a minute to look at some of the things folks said in the chat about what you all offer, because um, we really want to hear um, more of your thoughts about this important topic. So we have about 12 minutes for Q&A. And I'm thinking that the easiest way to do that will be to have folks use this reaction button to raise your hands. 
I can see almost everyone and I'll scroll back and forth. Um, I think that may be easier than trying to go through the chat. So let's try that out. Um, does anyone have a burning question? So I see Janetta Bell, the hand raised. Yes, my question is um, to the panelists and you all did a great job. <laughs> um, I would like to know, in your opinion, do you think that school leaders uh, do a good job as far as reaching out to parents to include them in college readiness activities at the school? So maybe we'll have a quick response from Isabel and then Darren and then Grant. I feel like they could do a better job because when I was in high school, even though my experience for senior year with college readiness was online, so it was a little different, they kind of went through us more instead of our parents. So I feel like they weren't getting as much information. Okay. They did like an okay job. It's just the students didn't want to listen and well, they didn't really trust because they had their own issues at their home problems. So I feel like um pretty much, yeah. That's all I have to say. My bad for it. I agree with both with both what they both said and uh I haven't started it yet, but I think that college, uh, colleges and counselors should work a little bit closer with parents, parents trying to get the students to commit to colleges and things like that. Okay, thank you. I see Avery with the hand up. Um, yeah, I just wanted to echo, um, thanks for being on this call this afternoon, Isabel and Grant and Darren. It's been so nice to hear your comments and thoughts. My question is, um, you know, after a year of COVID, um, how do you guys, do you think that you still feel the same about your personal agency now, which is, you know, that feeling of being in charge of your life? So we're all kind of heading into almost year two and a half or two of this. And I'm just curious if you still feel that sense of agency and what that might mean for, for how you're thinking about going forward in life. Um, I feel like at first when COVID first happened and I got took out of school and everything changed that I had no sense of control over my life. And it honestly had affected my mental health and my willingness to like be hopeful for the future a lot. I'm not going to lie, but I finally have the past couple of months have been coming to like grips with myself and realizing that I do have control over my future. So I finally am feeling more confident about that, but it also has literally to do with the fact that the past couple of months I've been surrounded by adults who have been uplifting me, so. Darren or Grant? Uh, so I think also I agree with Isabel saying that how in the beginning of the pandemic, she didn't really feel like she uh, had control over her life. And I feel like as a high school student, I don't really get to make the big decisions over what's going to go on at my school. But I feel like that as COVID has been getting more controlled in the in our city, I feel like it's become a lot, but I've gained a little bit more control of my life in the school and just in my personal life. Okay, and Darren? Well, I agree with both. Well, I can mainly talk on mental health because I was in the right mindset. So I was really out of control, but now currently going into like deeper, deeper and through the pandemic, I feel like pandemic. I feel like I got more, like, I can feel better about myself and, and more con in control, but I'm still going there to the top. I'm in, like in mid, I'm in the medium right now. I'm not at the high, but I feel like I'm getting better as I work. That's good. So I see, Sh is it Shuna? Hi, it's Shuna. Yeah, before you ask your question, I want to thank you for being part of the group at Connect Detroit that helped us get access to the young people to take the survey. I didn't notice your name um, at the beginning, but just a public acknowledgement that we couldn't have done this without you. So your question. Yay, thank you. And uh, my colleague, Nikita Buckhoy is here as well, who really facilitated okay, that. Um, so my question, first, thank you young people for just sharing so much of your insights and uh, being vulnerable here in this space. I would like to ask, um, each of you mentioned the importance of adults and connections to caring and adults as being important and helping to facilitate your hope. Um, 
But then in the survey, we saw that there's a gap of kids who don't have that. Um, the numbers were low or the numbers were intermediate. Do you feel that the peer group, your, your um, friends and young people your age can fill that gap in some ways? Or do you feel it's really important that that needs to be adults to make that difference? Um, I would say that this is like, honestly, like it feels everything we're talking about, like adult through, um, support and stuff like that is really like personal to me. And I had an experience where for about like a year of time, I feel like me and a couple of my friends and like my siblings and stuff, we really tried to be each other's like support and we tried to be each other's rock. And we were all going through like a really hard time mental health wise and with like school and everything. And we were there for each other and we knew it, but it still didn't change the fact that we didn't, we felt like we didn't have any adults there for us. So it wasn't really changing our mental like direction as far as if we felt hopeful. So I think it is important. I also think it's important to have uh, young children or your friends also talk to you and be a little role model in your life, if you want to call it that, just to make sure that you're on a safe, uh, safe track and in a good uh, headspace and mental health. Well, from my experience, me and my friends, we looked after each other like as Bill said, I agree with that. Well, we did have parents like in our lives to help us out, but like they was going through the same struggles as us because like they don't know what we want mentally and we would have talked to them because like we would feel like it's a huge gap. So I feel like it's important. So I don't see any other hands raised unless I'm missing it. I see Michelle on the phone. Uh, Michelle was part of the team that actually put the survey out there. So I want to acknowledge you and say hello. Um, I see Joyce Dallas, was your hand up? Yes. Um, earlier, I, I, I noted it down. I think it was Isabel who said something about when you, you talked about younger children feeling more supported by adults than older. And she mentioned adults judging older youth more than younger. And it seems it's a really, it struck me because it's like the whole object of this exercise is that we want young people to come successfully into adulthood. But it seems like as they begin to get to the age where they are facing adult challenges and perhaps making adult mistakes, we judge them more than when, when they're young. And I want to hear maybe from them how we can, you know, change and do different so that mm -hmm. we are able to not just be so judgmental and, and turn maybe, you know, not support someone who's doing something that we might feel is quote unquote, um, you know, they're making a mistake and we can't be there for them or not enough. That's a great question. So Isabel, I'd offer you the first response, but Darren or Grant, if you want to weigh in as well afterwards, please feel free. So first off, thank you for mentioning that because I feel like you really heard me. And that's like um, just something I feel like it's overlooked and people don't really talk about. Um, but I feel like the narrative with the way that we address young adults and how we address helping them come up needs to change because when it comes to those, um, adult mistakes before I feel like the adult's purpose in our life, even though they're supposed to be here to help us become adults, it would be more of a like chastised situation. And it's more of a just, no, don't do that. Instead of why are we not getting guidance? Why, are, why do we not feel like we can ask adults questions? Why do we not feel like we can't like talk about how we got here or why we got here, or what we could have done different or just get some like actual guidance and advice to prevent something from happening in the future instead of being um, talked down upon because we're just trying to experience life, which is the same things like all of you adults were young adults at 1.2, making experiences that and experiencing new things. So I just feel like 
that needs to change. Grant or Darren? I would just say that I agree with what Isabella said, how you should uh, make sure that you treat others how you would want to be treated, really. And how if you were in their shoes, if you were at their age, you don't know what's going on in their home. You don't know what they have access to. So they may think what they're doing is the right decision. And you may see that's a terrible thing going on in their life. So if you see it like that, you should probably talk to them, have a conversation saying, hey, if you keep going on this path, you may not have a good outcome. So just try to make sure you say, yeah, at least let them know that what they're doing may not be helping them and may be harming them. Mm -hmm. And Darren? Yeah, I agree with both because as like older people in my life, they, they look at us down as like Gen Z. So that's the main topic. Like they always super, like they always talk down on us where I feel like well, when I, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, like I just need the guidance like to be taught to me so I could just know the way so I could be like right in my own way. So I feel like I agree with both of them what they said. So I'll like yeah, I do. I want. I just want the adults hear us out more because they usually ignore the fact because they think we're young and immature. So mm -hmm. like, so if the if they think we, I just want to like just make us mature. Like it just it's confusing because like I know they was young. I would know. I know they was like once young before as Isabel said. So I feel like they just need to just put us in the same shoes. Like they should step in our shoes. Yeah, it, it it's it's funny. Uh, what what you said makes me think that maybe adults are repeating some of the mistakes that were made when they were growing up. So instead of remembering how they felt when adults in their lives talk down to them, as, as Darren just said, or were judgmental, they're just repeating that. So I think that's, I'm really glad that question was raised so that we could all hear you all respond to it. I see Sade Ward. Hello, can you all hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Hi, I am Sade. I'm with the um, Cody Rouge Community Action Alliance and Grant is a part of our youth council. So wonderful to see Grant today and the other youth. I have a question um, for you all about virtual programming. Um, it has been a year, over a year of programming that we've been doing. You all have been in school virtually um, and a lot of our youth programming has been virtual. So my question is, as we transition into face-to-face -face programming, um, how do you all feel about virtual programming? Do you feel like it's something that you'd like to continue to do um, as, as the year goes by or as the next few years go by? Or is it something that you're just totally, completely ready to be done with? Personally, I like uh, being online every once in a while and also being in person every once in a while. So like as our youth council, we, we meet once a week. So I feel like if we meet, since we meet four times a month, I feel like if maybe one of those four meetings we had was in person so we could just be able to see our pals and see what they look like and also just be able to do hands-on activities. I feel like that also would be a good thing because online you can be anywhere and be on a Zoom meeting, but in person, if you're not there at four o'clock and you won't be able to attend the meeting. So I feel like being there online will help you get all the information even if you can't be there physically. Mm -hmm. Darren? Um, oh, sorry. I feel like, yes, I love virtual, but some, like, it did have some, like, technical difficulties during, like, when I was in school for virtual classes. So I feel like, so, like, when somebody, like, do absences or, like, miss some days, yeah, you can just switch over to, like, have a meeting with them students that didn't come and just go over, like, what they miss and just, or you can just um basically just they can probably have an option, like they can probably just have a class where if they don't feel comfortable in person, but they can still come like weekly if they want to. And yeah, that's all I got to say. Grant? Um, so I was going to say, I think that some high schools now I've seen are doing like hybrid where you can sign your kid up to like do virtual if they want or sign them up to stay home if they want, which I honestly think is the smartest decision because it keeps the schools less populated, but the kids that want to come in can still come in. And the reason I say this is because I personally hated online school. Um, school you said you me, hated your school? I hated online school. Okay. Like mm -hmm. doing it over the computer. Um, because school for me was my getaway. 
like some kids don't like their home lives and need support from seeing their peers and their teachers and like getting up and having a reason to brush their teeth and put their clothes on every day. And um, for me, during this past year, I was a senior in high school and I had fallen into a really bad like pit of depression and I couldn't even get myself to get up out of bed because you literally didn't have to. You just had to open your laptop. So personally, it wasn't my cup of tea, but I know a lot of kids, it helped out because some kids are socially anxious and being at home is what they needed. So that's also what it is. It's just listening to everyone because everybody is different and all kids need different things in order to flourish. Yes. So we had a hand up. Um, my old college grad school buddy, Brian Sales, has a great question he dropped in the chat and I asked him to ask, ask the panelists or maybe ask all of us. Well, hello, Andrea and everyone. Uh, Dr. Anderson, it's a pleasure to be here with you all. This is a fantastic uh, presentation. I do work in the youth mentoring field. Um, the question I, I wanted to ask um, was, a, was around the um, assessment and the survey. Um, Isabel brought up an important point that often here in the work that I've done with young people and with organizations. So oftentimes we as adults promote the idea of career, or excuse me, college readiness, but not necessarily awareness around uh, trade, technical, or military school in terms of as a positive outcome. And I wanted to know perhaps if that was thought about, number one, as being an idea to third question uh, talking anecdotal experiences both from work and a little bit of research that sometimes young people who are not on the career path excuse me on the college path college readiness path sometimes can feel disconnected or not feel that they are um, achieving at a higher level and I'm just wondering so I guess I'm asking two questions and maybe Dr. Anderson can articulate a little better for me so thank you oh. I don't want to take a lot of airspace explaining why we didn't ask that question, but I will take it as a point to for us to talk about at Skillman as we think about any modifications we're going to make to the survey. I think our shorthand at Skillman is college and career, and I think your point suggests that we should probably break out multiple pathways and give children the opportunity to respond so we get a better sense of kids' aspirations for, as you point out, trade, technical, military, and even jobs that don't fall in those three categories. So your point is well taken, but I'd rather have Isabel, Darren, and Grant talk about your experiences, particularly you, Isabel, as, as um, based on what we talked about right before the call, um, your plans and where college does or doesn't fit in, and then maybe for Darren and Grant the same. Um, so me personally, um, like I said, I was just a high school senior. I graduated in June and the plan, like for most kids, was to go to college this fall. But since COVID happened and then a lot of things in my personal life at home happened and then that just didn't end up being the path that I was able to take. So at first, it honestly made me feel less than like that I wasn't doing good enough and that I was less than my peers who are in college right now. But then I just feel like we need to um, help kids who are taking different paths because then at the same time, when I step back and think about um, what I'm doing right now, I work at the Detroit Hispanic Development Corporation in the youth department and I'm only 18 years old and I make $15 an hour and I work a full-time job. So I'm super proud of myself for that. And so my plan now, even though it has changed, is to save up some money and hopefully get a car so I can have my own reliable source of transportation and then do college next year. And whether that be not a full-time schedule or just a couple of classes, that's still something I want to achieve, but just not in the same timeline. Like it didn't look the same for me that it looked for my other peers, but that's okay. So. Okay. Darren and Grant, and we have we have a couple of minutes left. Um, so Darren and Grant. I agree with Isabella with what she said. I just want to add that I have a couple of friends who also aren't really interested in going to college because they have uh, career choices that aren't 
required by college. And they, I also have friends who don't really like school and they don't like the, just the whole aspect of doing homework and studying things like that. So I feel like introducing another area where asking if students are ready to go into trade school or the army or any other area of a career is a good thing to be added onto the survey in the future. Okay, and Darren? For my experience, I still go to my school recently right now because since last year, they didn't have like, well, college, like, <clears throat> well, college advisors to talk to you to go to like, keep like, we keep your focus on it. But currently right now, I have some college advisors that still talk to me from my high school. So I feel like once people leave high school, I feel like the school should reach out still, like, like the schools should still reach out to them and whatever craft way they do, like they still help them out but like on like a yearly or like up to like weekly or monthly if they want to. Okay. So we have two minutes left and three things, well, one minute left and three things. I wanted to make sure to say that we're doing another Let's Talk event next month with um, young, and it's gonna be focused on youth entrepreneurship um, with kids from the Detroit Food Academy and Grace in Action. So keep your eyes posted on our social media, um, channels and our newsletter and blog for the exact date. And I'm sure that all of you who registered for this will get an email about that. And we have enough time. Uh, Lindsay had a question and I see why price. We may go over a little, but I do want to get uh, why price is question in before we wrap. And then maybe Lindsay's as well. Okay, going once, going twice. All right, Lindsay, I what was your mine question? in the chat? Yeah, I dropped oh. mine in the chat. Do you want to ask it now while we still have the panel? Sure. Um, <laughs> I was saying that a lot of times as adults, we talk about um, college readiness. But to the panelists, do you believe that we spend um, enough time just caring about social and emotional wellness or just like the whole eight dimensions of wellness, making sure you're OK before you go out in the world and become a change maker? I think that that is a huge important point that is not ever addressed and I think it needs to be addressed more often because a lot of the times it's and it's way more common than you guys think a lot of my friends in high school and just in life struggle with mental health issues that are more crippling than you guys realize and we were just getting a lot of us it's sad to say but felt like we didn't have the will to keep going on and then we were just getting college pushed in our face you know and I feel like we need to like in schools focus on like making checking in with the students, making sure that they're mentally okay and things like that, other than just test applications. Yeah, I agree. Saying you should focus on all aspects of mental health and things like that. I also just say that, you know, you should focus in school, teach st uh, students that you don't have to be successful just by going to college. There are other ways you can make a living for yourself, not just by going to college. And I think, yeah, that's one of the really important. I agree both. Well, I agree with well, both my bad. So I feel like you can just have a mental conversation with them, like be their therapist. So who I feel like is like, you just talk to them like the aspects of college since they didn't have that. Well, like the seniors like me, like class 2021, well, some going into the fall of 2022 and some of my friends in college right now, but they still struggling because like it was just right in their face. So I feel like, well, what they have, what they have is like people talk to them about like, what their experiences in college is. So I feel like it should be looked upon of like just, just keeping them mentally updated instead of just letting them just rot. Yeah. So I'm in a, um, a, a, a crazy position because we're at, we're two minutes over time. Um, the, the conversation is still heating up. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if we had time for one more question and then we'll wrap up. Lindsay? Sure, thanks Andrea. And thank you, Darren, Grant and Isabella. Um, super appreciate you all for sharing so much with us today. My question is about something that came up a little bit earlier in the conversation, which is trust. And I think that all three of you have brought it up at some point. And I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking about how like sometimes as adults, we can make the assumption that like because of a certain position that we have or because we've been around for a while, young people will trust us and come to us with some of the things that you talked about in terms of like really personal experiences or really needing to be able to trust to confide in someone. And so I'm wondering if it's not too personal or if you have a highlight that you think 
adults on the call can learn from about like what's something that for for adults that you really trust like what's something that they did to really like work at and earn like earn and foster trust in your relationship it's a great question i would say something that uh adults in my life worked at to gain my trust was uh they also gained my respect because I didn't just automatically give them trust. And I, they also didn't just automatically give my respect. They had to do something or tell me something that really stuck with me and made me actually feel like this person is actually looking out for me. And I feel like, what if they say something to me, I can actually go back and they will help me in life and not hurt me. Excellent. I feel like, um... The people we bring into our schools and into environments where we have youth is very important because a lot of something that goes into trust, um, just like Grant said, was like earning respect. But a lot of the times I felt like while being in middle school and in high school that the we need I feel like we need to be careful about the people we let work with the kids because there was a lot of times it seemed like the adults around us didn't even want to be there or that it was a burden to be teaching our classroom. Mm -hmm. or that they had a bad attitude about it. And that's not going to make your students open up to you or want to be around you or feel like you're a trustworthy person to open up to if we don't even feel like you want to be around us or like be educating us. So I feel like that's important. Okay. Darren? Based on my personal experience throughout my high school, it was my coaches, well, what they did, well, when I was doing my ups and downs and and the, and the loss of my parent, well, one of my parents. So they really kept me motivated. And throughout the whole school year, they throughout the whole school year, they kept me focused. And my teachers really, I used that's what gave me their trust because like they talked to me mentally because I really just wanted to give up school at that point because I didn't. And plus, I couldn't see nobody face to face. And I'm like, I like just seeing people faces, just not just sitting on a screen all day like this. Well, so I feel like. Yeah, I, they just, they've been through all my ups and downs and they keep pushing me forward in the, in the current summer youth program. Well, that ended right now, but they kept me motivated and I got to see throughout Detroit and, and, and they, uh, and it's just a whole, like the youth prospect, like everybody in the youth, uh, they were just pretty cool to me. And I feel like when the options I got to do is just keep me happy and I looked forward to continuing this program and well, basically, is <clears throat> my bad. So I can, I could, <clears throat> I look like, well, just doing this program, I just want to help out the next year youth and just be cool with them and talk about mental issues throughout their personal experiences. Well, so I want to thank the three panelists and again ask the audience to at least give uh, snaps or applause. You all did a great job. I want to thank you for being so vulnerable and honest with some questions that may have felt personal, but you just rolled with it. I know I learned a lot from listening to you, and I'm sure um, I can tell from the chat lots of comments about how the, the, the um, points you made are resonating with the adults on the call. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant job.